Welcome everyone. My name is Kate Kratzen and I'm the acting director and curator of the David Winton Bell Gallery of Brown University. Thank you to Greg Picard and Sean Tavares for overseeing tech today and to Katie Vincelet for overseeing the many other elements of this program that remain hidden. Thank you to our panelists for joining us in this conversation and before introducing them, I would like to note that Brown, like many universities and arts institutions, is in the process of creating a meaningful acknowledgement of the indigenous peoples and their connections to the land that Brown University occupies. I adopt this language from my colleagues in the Native American and Indigenous Studies Initiative here at the university and invite viewers to visit the page on their website that elaborates the current process. When I asked Savannah Knoop, who currently has a solo exhibition on view at the Bell, who their dream person would be for a conversation around their filmmaking practice, their first response was Janixa Bravo. I had just listened to Janixa's conversation with Maori Holmes, our moderator today, on the Black Star Projects podcast, Many Lumens, and was also highly anticipating Janixa's translation of the 148 tweet Zola thread to a feature length film that is being released on June 30th. Savannah mentioned early in our programmatic conversations that they, that they were working with Brontes Purnell, whose book 100 Boyfriends was on my shelf at the time, on a screenplay for his novel, Since I Laid My Burden Down. And as Savannah and I talked about moderation of this panel, the complexities of translation from one medium, Twitter, autobiography to another, I repeatedly said, we need to find someone as amazing as Maori to moderate. And finally, I just asked her, and despite recently founding a magazine and podcast, among many other ongoing projects, she generously said yes. So here we are, halfway through Savannah's stellar solo exhibition at the Bell. And while we are not currently open to the public, we just found out we are opening July 9th for two weekends. So please pay attention to our social media. Right now we're closed. The virtual does offer us a platform to Savannah's expansive practice, particularly in moving image and screenwriting. I am thrilled that they are joined by such an incredible group of panelists and look forward to a discussion around the many ways that collective works in film align and diverge. Janixa Bravo is an award-winning director and writer who continues to push the creative boundaries in Hollywood by breathing life into the most distinctive of stories. Most recently, Janixa served as the director and co-writer of the highly anticipated film Zola, which is based on a viral 148 tweet thread by Asia Zola King, which will be released by A24 in theaters this summer. The film explores the story of Zola's road trip to Florida with her unlikely friend, Stephanie. What begins as a seductive and glamorous trip quickly transforms into a 48 hour odyssey. Co-written by slave play playwright, Jeremy O'Harris and starring Taylor Page, Riley Keough, Nicholas Braun and Coleman Domingo, the film premiered in competition at the 2020 Sundance Film Festival and received critical acclaim, calling it indie film art. Upcoming, Janixa will write, direct, and executive produce Anna Perna's series adaptation of Ian Parker's New Yorker article, A Suspense Novelist Trail of Deceptions, which will star Jake Gyllenhaal. The series will explore the complex life of former book editor Dan Mallory and the struggles and strange twists that led to his historic success of writing the first debut novel to hit number one on the New York Times bestseller list in 12 years. Janix's previous film work has screened at AFI, BAM, Carnegie Hall, South by Southwest, Sundance, and Tribeca. Her feature film debut, Lemon, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and was sold to Magnolia Pictures. In 2014, Filmmaker Magazine named her as one to watch in 25 New Faces of Film. That same year, her short film, Gregory Go Boom, won the jury prize for US fiction at Sundance. In television, she directed the Juneteenth episode of Atlanta, as well as episodes of HBO's Divorce, Here and Now, In Treatment, Netflix's Love and Dear White People, and Amazon's Forever. An NYU graduate with a degree in directing and theater design, Janixa was born in New York City and currently resides in Los Angeles. Maori Kamel Holmes is a curator, filmmaker, and writer. She founded Black Star Film Festival in 2012 and serves as its artistic director and CEO. She has organized film programs at Anthology Film Archives, Museum of Contemporary Art Los Angeles, the Underground Museum, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. As a director, her works have screened internationally. Maori was the 2019-2020 Soros Equality Fellow and serves as media maker in residence at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania curator at large at the Annenberg Center for the Performing Arts, as well as a creative executive with Blackbird. 
Savannah Knoop is an artist and educator working in film, sculpture, writing, and performance. They have exhibited and performed at the Institute of Contemporary Art, Philadelphia, Artist Curated Projects Los Angeles, and the Whitney Museum of American Art, Museum of Modern Art, Movement Research, and Leslie Lohman Museum, New York. Her solo exhibition, Savannah Knoop, Soothing the Seams, is currently on view at the Bell Gallery of Brown to University students, staff, and faculty, but again, we open to the public for two weekends beginning July 9th. Brontes Purnell is a writer, musician, dancer, filmmaker, and performance artist. He is the author of a graphic novel, a novella, a children's book, and the novel Since I Laid My Burden Down. Recipient of the 2018 Whiting Award for Fiction, he was named one of the 32 Black male writers of our time for T New York Times Style Magazine in 2018. Purnell is also the frontman for the band The Younger Lovers, the co-founder of the experimental dance group The Brontes Purnell Dance Company, the creator of the renowned cult zine Fag School, and the director of several short films, music videos, and most recently, the documentary Unstoppable Feet, Dances of Ed Mock. He recently released his current novel, 100 Boyfriends on FSG times MCD. Born in Triana, Alabama, he's lived in Oakland, California for 19 years. Thank you again to all of our panelists and I'll let Maori take it from here. Um, well, thank you all for um, participating in this conversation. Uh, Savannah, I have not seen your show. So I, I'm, this is like a really broad conversation around all of your practices. Um, but I wanna start with um, a prompt that I was given by Kate that I think there's something in each of your current projects or recent projects that is about translation. Um, and so I feel like we can just start with like, just go heavy from the beginning and just for you to think about how translation is used um, in your work. And so Janixa, thinking about the tweets to Zola, um, thinking about uh, translating a book into a film for you, Brantes, and then also Savannah, uh, your personal practice of attending or, you know, attending might not be the right, visiting bathhouses into this exhibition, if you all want to start with that. Oh, look at this eager group. <laughs> Please someone start. I'll start, I'll start. <laughs> so um, my project about the baths is called Screens, a project about community. And it is so much about like how our bodies, when you go into these different variable temperature rooms, you're literally filtering, your body's filtering through sweat and emotions. And it brings up all these different, you know, you're sort of sloughing through all your, your dead skin and your <laughs> sweat. And so, and within the bathhouse, I started this project sort of around the time of the 2016 election with Trump. And so there were all these conversations happening in the baths that were really heated and people would just keep, it was sort of like the politics of the outside world were coming into the space and taking us over. And so I found myself getting into all of these fights with people in a 240 degree room and you sort of had to decide whether you wanted to engage in that fight whether it was worth it to be overheated and having these heated conversations in the room or was it better to just leave and go into the cold plunge and so so this idea about um how we're always filtering our experiences through us and what you decide to keep and what you decide to leave out. And I think it comes through like, I mean, I think we're always adapting these sort of raw unmediated events that happen in our lives or, you know, you have it with the news every day. Current events are sort of formed into story and transformed into these edited streamlined accounts of what happened that day. And um, thinking about how we sort of do that all the time in our lives. But then I think is when you're making art, there's a process of translating a raw unmediated event into like um, that that is a creative act that we choose certain parts and we pull in certain parts and 
those decisions all really matter towards how the story is formed. And of course, like each form also brings out different potentials for the story to be untangled in different ways. So um, I could also bring in, I guess, the JT Leroy project, which was like, I had a long trajectory of like living as someone else. And that was sort of a raw unmediated event. And then looking back at that and translating that into memory, into a memoir, and then making a film about it, you felt the sort of the way that the form was squeezed different parts of the story out in the technology of a book, it's so interior and personal, but then in a film, it's a, a purely visual form. And so you have to create a sort of compressed and um, you pull out and have a compressed visual language that you're working with. So yeah, translation. <laughs> I kind of have to start um, kind of uh, like with the idea of like they always say in my bio, Brontes Purnell is a multidisciplinary artist, but they always treat it like it's like this really holy thing when in all actuality, I just think it's closer to the gig economy. We no longer are in the period of the greats where someone can really just sit in a room and take photographs all day and be like, I'm a photographer. It's just like, you really, have to be able to like, yo, know, like make a movie, write the book, do whatever. It reads as like prophetic artists when they say multidisciplinary, what it sometimes should read it as is desperate survivalists who has to get the job done. So <laughs> sometimes like, um, yeah, like when I'm writing in books, it's like an isolationist practice where I do get to be like narrator as God. And I so often don't have that in my life at all. So I like writing books because the voice becomes me. Whereas like when you translate this to film, right? A picture is worth a thousand words. So that's when you go from isolationist narrator as God to the visually expansive. Something about that becomes condensed. Then when I'm moving over to performance art where you're like in a theater with just picture, sound and motion, there's a distillness or a distilling that happens. You have to distill all these things down into an abstract that kind of hits. And so um, when I think of I don't know, when I think of translation, I don't know, it's it's a bunch of different languages at once, but to quote City Girls, um, pussy talk, does pussy speak English, Spanish, and French? Thank you for quoting City Girls. I just feel like it ends there, honestly. That was great, thank you. Uh, translation, I uh, feel I did an adaptate, I would use the word adaptation for myself. Um, it's 148 Twitter thread that I read in 2015 in the fall when it was written. I think it is the uh, first piece credited as kind of inventing uh, threading on Twitter, telling a story in that way. Uh, I um, made a film out of it. Uh, in terms of my translation, my adaptation, I just relied heavily on the source material to tell the story. It was the thing, the, the reason this piece was being made uh, or the, the reason it came to me or even had any light, you know, shine on it and why the Hollywood, some portion of Hollywood thought this was a story worth making was because of Black Twitter. So Black Twitter really elevated this piece, they catapulted it. And so when it came time to actually making the film, I thought the most responsible thing to do was to speak to the thing that people showed up for, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a, another thread that I feel like you started to bring up, Brontes, and that's all of you are um, filmmakers, writers, and have either an active or historical history as performers, if that's an, as an actor or a dancer or, you know, years long impersonation. Um, and so 
I just wanted to kind of ask you about, I'm always interested in this performance of everyday life. Um, and I think particularly when we think about, um, you know, BIPOC folks, femme folks, queer folks under a white cishet male gaze, you know, there is a performance under that gaze. And I'm wondering if each of you as part of your, you know, celebrity, and I use that word loosely, not to say that you're like, you know, Tom Cruise, but, you know, people know who you are and recognize you. And so do you have a character um, that you kind of step into when you're to represent yourself as an artist? I'm sure. I, I think I have a front of the house and back of the house personality. And in each of those personalities, there are a multitude of voices. I speak in a lot of registers, depending on who is on the other side. When I want something, and if I want something generally from a straight white man, I there are two registers that work. And one is either to be someone's daughter or the other is to be someone uh, that want that they want to fuck. And those are the two that happen. And sometimes, of course, there's nuance in between, but it is like one of those two things. You know, I'm either I'm either the baby or, you know, some sort of kitten. And it's not to say that I'm like speaking in that character, but my register changes depending on what personality I need to bring to the table. And then I think when I'm working as a director, I think a lot about being in drag, that I have this sense of director drag and um, I'm really center myself on like desexualizing. I don't, I don't want to read as, as a female. I want to read as genderless. I want to read sort of neutral. I don't want to have breasts. I don't want to have like genitals, you know, um, and I just feel stronger in that space, not to say that I don't feel strong in my woman's body, but when I'm performing direction, uh, I am most like turned on by myself when I read genderless or when I read neutral. Savannah, you want to add to that? Or sorry, Brent, as you. You go, Savannah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I love that the, the register thing is really real. I feel like, yeah, we, we proliferate different selves to be out in the world, especially with cis men, maybe it's a good point, but, um, I feel like I, I don't know. I feel like I get into like uh very ornery or very serious very quickly <laughs> and and um yeah and then i feel like with you know that there's that exercise where you go like one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and then that whatever you end up with is your actual register and i feel like that is so weird because my voice is going all over the place all the time. And, um, but yeah, I feel like with friends and people that I feel comfortable with, my voice is going over and around and, but I really try to control it and, and keep it low <laughs> or something. And I think that that is that pressure of that you, you guys were pointing out. Um, sometimes I like, don't know who I am just being from, like Alabama, but then even in the complication of being in Northern California for almost 20 years, like in my head, like even when I'm talking to myself, I will simultaneously hear like an old Southern man, an old Southern woman, a Valley girl, and then just like the voice I need when I have to get jobs. <laughs> um, uh, but in terms of persona, the biggest complication I have is like being a writer and just like with all my books, Johnny, would you love me if my dick were bigger? Since I laid my burn down 100 boyfriends, with all marginal writers, in order for us, it feels like in order for us to be seen as authentic, our work has to be memoir, you know? Mm -hmm. So I often, I often have to like assert myself as a fiction writer. Because like my friend had a girlfriend too that was just like trying to sell a cookbook. And she went to a couple of editors that were like, oh, this cookbook is nice, but like, do you have problems with your father or dating problems? Maybe we can interweave that in, you know? In order for us to be seen like as authentic, we must be spilling the like deepest, darkest, most gut-wrenching parts of our 
histories essentially for them to use against us. And because also the only people smart enough to write fiction, right, is white men. Hence like why, you know, a white dude can write memoirs of a geisha. I know that's the most extreme example, but I love it because it hits. Um, and like not be questioned. Whereas the question I get all the time is how much of your books are true, Brontes? And part of me is just like, that doesn't matter at all. Like you should listen to what I have to say, whether or not I'm professing to save the world with my art or not. And also everything I do is a composite of all of us, like all of our experiences and me always having to assert that, yes, I faggot, black, punk rock writer, am still the universal hero. I don't care who you are. You need to be able to look at me and see yourself within me. How many years of my life did I have to read a separate piece growing up and locate myself in some white boy from the East Coast who went to prep school and understand him as the universal hero? I think the next step in like literature and these representation Olympics that we get into is every person needs to be able to see Zola. They need to be able to see Deshaun. And since I laid my burden down, they need to see JT Leroy and be like, no, I know part of this. This is what drama is, us locating what is like the hero's journey in this and where I locate myself in it. Yeah, thank you for um, bringing all of that up. I am always frustrated with this idea, um, even in sort of the work that I do, I find because grad schools or wherever we get our training sort of push marginalized folks to do those excavations. And sometimes they're necessary to your point, we should see Zola as the center of a story. But also if you wanna make a story about, you know, Sally from Iowa as, you know, not Sally from Iowa, you should have the freedom to do that. And we're not given that freedom, right? And so that is always something that I'm really curious about because I hate when we put ourselves in the box, right? Like it's one thing, for a publisher, you know, a distributor, et cetera, to tell you what you can do versus people putting themselves in that. But one of the things I wanted to ask you with this character um, business, the reason I'm, I'm asking about it, so I have a lot of Sagittarian friends and I love talking about astrology. And I find the Sagittarius is really good at creating these characters. Um, and so that was one of the things that had me thinking about it. But from the characters that you invent, the various ones, where do they show up in your work? Like, so besides how you present, do the pieces of your character show up in your work repeatedly? Okay, I'm gonna go back in because I'm a Cancer double Sagittarius. So essentially I'm a little Kim wrapped in a double Nicki Minaj, Ooh. which has aided my artistic journey greatly. Um, but well, essentially with 100 Boyfriends, it's told, um, it's told in a temporal space. It's not one character, but I couldn't really talk about this like with like my editor because it was too much. But the idea is that it is one connective soul acting out in a total multiverse, right? You are supposed to see these like hundred different black dudes or whatever, but their stories are running simultaneously in different like kind of multiverses. They might say the same things, they may act the same things, but it is about the idea that, I don't know, each experience is a total different life. Um, and so it's a total different life and a total different experience. And so, yeah, like these characters, these characters connect, but it's kind of like these different paths and these different journeys that are leaving us in different places. Thank you. Um, so another question that I had on here, and I'm kind of realizing they're not going in order, so I apologize for any delays. Um, but something that one of you just said is making me also wonder, I think it was you, Brontes, if we are actually even able as artists to uh, present the truth. And so I think with regard to adaptations or translations, um, do you all even attempt to present the truth? Um, Savannah, this is something I think you could probably think about uh, with the JT Leroy project also. Um, but, you know, is lying, I think there's a quote from Toni Morrison from a, a long time ago that I'm going to very quickly butcher, but about how it's in fiction that we get to the truth. And I'm sort of curious if you all think that lying or misrepresentation actually helps to lead us to the truth in some way. 
um, or if you're dis disinterested in that. Yeah, I think that this, to go back to this, like, like a compulsion that things have to be true. Like if you're gonna tell a story, it has to be a memoir. Everything has to be exactly as it was. That is following the same line with people people saying they don't care about fiction or they don't um, like they only read books that are not fiction or this idea that like that fiction has no value. And I think fiction creates so much space for to be able to find like emotional trajectories that are true or to sort of transfer and discover. I mean, I think after what we've gone through with Trump, like there's certain things about facts that, like I feel like I used to feel really relativist and now I'm like, no, there's actually some, some hard boundaries around like certain facts. And, but I think, I wish that culturally we celebrated fiction in the way that that quote speaks about. And, and I think that I know from my own experience of like translating the, the memoir, which was written from memory, and when is memory ever completely true? Because of course it's colored by all of, you know, the color of memory, but that um, that you, uh, I just, oh, that in the, in translating it into film, then you get to play within the boundaries of like what part of the story is, essential and how do we get to the emotional truth of that narrative and I think that that happens within all forms of fiction and it's like in, it's so important for us to be able to celebrate that and play within those boundaries. Oh. So like I'm an old school riot girl and there is like this band um, from England they did a split with my favorite band Bikini Kill and like Riot Girl literature is so fun. And the one thing that I remember, because there was a lot of Riot Girl narratives and performance art where they were dealing with like sexual abuse, people's histories, and notoriously in the media, it was used against them. You know, if a girl wrote a story about a father being a molester, they would print the girl's name and being like, so-and-so was molested by their father when really they were telling the narrative of someone else. But the one thing that's, I read this when I was probably 14 or 15 and it always stuck with me. And they said, we are into the use of lies, but never at the expense of the truth, mm -hmm. which I think has always been kind of like my basis of like, yeah, like, like writing fiction, you know, and just even when you're writing memoir, like the second you write it down, it's fiction. I could write a story about my life, true as I goddamn know it. But the second my mother reads it, she's going to be like, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, this didn't happen, this didn't, you know what I'm saying? So yeah, like um, the representing of truth or the use of lies, I think that's what, I think that's what drama and fiction is essentially. So I don't know. I think that those things are really important. Yeah, I really, I, I agree so much with everything both of you said. I I find myself comfortably disinterested in the truth. I just, I'm not a journalist. Um, I am interested in presenting the version of things that please me the most. And so I, in life, recast the narrative constantly. I I didn't know this, though. It was sort of brought to my attention by people I was close with, who I had experienced events with, which I would then tell the story. And the person who was with me, a couple of people started to get comfortable being like, it just wasn't, it didn't exactly happen like that. Or like, that's not how that person said that, or this looked like this, but it was so true to me, right? And ultimately I felt that the version I just told was funnier. I just told a better version of it. I mean, we were all there. The audience was captivated. Clearly, this version you're trying to tell me is the truth. It's it's lacking color. She has no arc. So here we are. So I just think that that is. I'm also an only child, so I think fibbing is inherent in being an only child because there is no one else to engage with, and you're growing up. So you're, you know, your your uh, your infrastructure is one in which it's so much of your imagination is a part of how you feel comforted. So. I'm very comfortable with 
the sort of soft edges of what is or isn't true. Thank you for saying fibbing. I haven't heard that <laughs> in so long and it makes me think of my grandmother and I, I wanna- I'm, I'm here to bring old energy. <laughs> Um, I, I have a similar practice of, of changing the story for coffee because it, why not? Um, so another question in this one um, is a little long, so bear with me, but I, I'm, I wanna think about it and I, I think you all will have something interesting. Um, there is this sort of emerging, um, or not emerging, but in my group of friends, we've been talking a lot lately about lower frequency politics. So thinking about like slackness or waywardness, looseness. Um, I know about this from Paul Gilroy in the Black Atlantic who talks about um, counterculture um, and thinking about you know, moral genealogy in hidden public spheres. And I know Cydia Hartman is talking about this and, and lots of other folks, but I, I wanna think about obviously um, sex work and Zola, um, everything that happens in the film, um, but Zola, the real person, um, is such a sharp human being. And when I read her interviews and hear her talk, it's very much someone that I'm, I'm thinking is quite aware of a kind of politic that we would dismiss, right? Um, and Brontes, I, could, I feel like your work, um, which I haven't read um, just to be transparent, but I, I read a couple of pages of the script and I read some interviews with you to prep for this. And I imagine that your work is doing a similar thing. Um, I read that you were obsessed with sex, <laughs> you know, and pleasure and thinking about how people can overlook that and the politics within that as well. And then, you know, Savannah as well, just going back to your current exhibition. So I just wanted to ask you all, how you feel about this idea of, um, I mean, I think we can talk about it in terms of like hip hop, right? If we wanna use someone like a Megan Thee Stallion, but just, just thinking about your own work and where this concept of lower frequency politics kind of enters and is it valuable to you? I am inherently prudish and the film, you know, the reason I'm on this panel is my most recent work, which is a film that's coming out soon, which is like hypersexual or is uh, very comfortable with its sex, sex and sexuality. Uh, and it was really exciting for me because it was incongruous to how I was reared. And I was, the, the person who wrote the Twitter thread, her name is Asia King, or she goes by Zola, the real Zola. Uh, she was 19 when she went through the story and it is like so ferocious and um, very comfortable with sexuality in a way that I just was so foreign to me, even at 35 or 36 when I read it. And I longed for even 10% of that, especially at 19, who is the woman I would be today if I had had some portion of this, if I had even brushed shoulders with somebody who was like this. Um, and the thing I really learned from her, I already, uh, and while I may be prudish, I am comfortable with, I'm, I'm prudish in my work, that, that's what I mean, not in, not in my bedroom, but that's not what we're talking about, like not in my like personal life, I just mean in my work, my work is a little like devoid of sex, but um, I was really excited to be able to like play, play pretend inside of this world where I was suddenly very comfortable um, sexually on screen, and um, I think that the thing around this sort of low, what you're saying, what you're calling lower frequency politics, I feel like something I've really noticed around the language of this film, particularly with like white critics or white journalists is the, the words they gravitate towards when talking about women who are comfortable with sex work or when talking about sex trafficking or talking about women who dance for money. And some of the language that they use is like really violent or really aggressive to me. And, um, and a lot of that language is dismissive and uh, devalues them and strips them of their humanity. And that, is something I have noticed in this process of working with a young woman who is so free in her sex and free in her body on a project that is so free and then engaging with people who seem to not be free. When I saw Zola, when I saw Zola, I immediately connected to that character. 
I hopped, I hopped in a van from Alabama with two perfect strangers to move to California. How I did old were you? 19. I was 19 years old. And it's like the farthest west I had ever been was Arkansas. You know, I had never even been to California. When I, that, then I read that, because it's like, it's crazy when I watched it, because essentially I was like, I am watching a goddamn sex trafficking comedy. What? But then also, I looked at that character, and I just, reading the tweets, like people, I feel were framing it as, oh, how could this girl be so stupid? How could this girl be so careless? Like, no, that girl was a fucking writer. She jumped in that band to write that story. And you are not fucking fooling me. I have been that girl. I know who that girl is. Do you know what I'm saying? Just the even, even coming to the Bay Area where I like immediately started doing sex work because like I was in that queer aesthetic cult. I was hanging out with all the leftist queers. The first thing we did was put an ad in the back of the BAR. But I think we were trying to get at those experiences, you know, like just kind of like to know. Essentially the reason too why I wanted to work with Savannah with Since I Laid My Burden Down is because Since I Laid My Burden Down is this kind of split story where half of it takes part in like Alabama, you know, and there are a couple people who were wanting to talk to me. These like, there was a couple of like these like black directors, but I, what I noticed is they only wanted to concentrate on the Southern part. And I just think in like literature and in movies, we have that part down, like, you know, the black choir church singing, the baptism scene, whatever. What I have never seen is people actually capture that, that last vestige of the Bay Area where like we were the kids paying $600 rent in the mission, doing sex work, having parties at warehouses. Like you go to looking the new tales of the city. No one has captured that yet. But Savannah was there and I was there. And I felt like that was the part of the story that we could actually like, you know, like merge these like kind of two things together. And so I don't know, like it was very, they call it, you know, like lower frequency, whatever, or like, you know, dirt bag, like leftist politics. But also I just, I also call it crunk feminism. Um, and, you know, just being in the complication of just like coming from Riot Girl and how um, our feminism always is in, our feminism always sits on a perilous fault line just because of the world. And I just think with these narratives that I still call it new narrative because I still feel like in 30 years, people are still trying to get it right. I feel like these are the things that we're constantly trying to capture because language still doesn't do everything. And we're still like, like kind of like creating the narratives for it. I use sex in everything, but also I don't, I call my work anti-erotica because I'm not writing about what is sexy about it. I like to talk about the occupational hazards of sex and the human aspects of sex. Feelings, behaviors don't make sense outside of feeling, my favorite Nikki Giovanni quote. Um, <laughs> and so if you can get, and then sex takes so many metaphors, sex can mean anxiety, Sex can mean like, you know, feeling like low self-esteem or high self-esteem or such being horniness or whatever. I think what we use sex as a vehicle, what we're actually trying to get to is what these base human feelings are, you know? And so that's how I'm always attacking sex in my work. What's the human angle? Attacking sex. <laughs> yeah, I feel, I feel I relate to that. I feel like it's my purview to, <laughs> to like, I feel like all of the work I make, I mean, if you have an obsession, I think it is sort of about that third space engagement where you're connecting with strangers. And I feel like sex is a metaphor, but it's of, of intimacy with people where you can't often find a way to be honest with others, but it works in other ways where it opens up this landscape of like the most awkward and vulnerable and projected moments of our lives. And so I feel like I spend most of my time in the bathhouse with other bodies 
And that's inherently, it's not sexy all the time, but I think it's like, it's about bodies being together and the sensuality of that. And also the awkwardness of that. And you feel so, you're so like laid bare. You don't have any of the usual tro like things to hide behind. But, and, and in my other work, like I do, I spend, I used to wrestle like it was my job before the quarantine. <laughs> and, uh, but um, that goes into a whole territory of intimacy with strangers. And, and you can know so much about people through moving around with them in these like heavy, sweaty, <laughs> lifting moments where and you don't use words at all and I feel like it's one of the moments where you can really feel an honesty from someone else but you it's not it's beyond language often enough and um and I yeah I feel like I'm such an intimacy hound and I I one, one of the things that I love about what when I was watching Zola was this moment where what you're pointing out, Brontes, where she says yes, and all these people are, they like that they they would think that that's a naive moment, but to me, that's a moment to like she's being open to this. She's being open, and that's another you know you could put that into the quantify it as like the politics politics of sluttery or something <laughs> slutness, but um, I'm I don't know, but that to me is a moment for it's such a powerful thing within the film because she says yes and then like the complications ensue but she still has her subjectivity and her capacity to tell the story honestly and I think you know the lower frequency things they people love to dismiss that and just write it off but actually it gets at so many sort of like universal topics of engaging with other humans in an honest I like, oh no because I, I mean never know why they never want to connect it to something larger because like when I look at Zola I see Cassandra you know what I'm saying like that character that's like yo like but like no one's listening to, they never like connected to like Cortez looking for the lost city of gold. Like, no, we're gonna go find the strip club where we can make $5,000 a night. And like the, like so much is like there, but we're constantly battling this, like the anti-intellectualism of like journalism and like kind of the world we live in. We're like, this is an epic Greek tragedy you know like and no one ever says like smart shit like that and so i don't know i feel like we're always trying to like fill in these blanks even when people are engaging with your work they're asking basic ass questions mm. just like can you ask me the question you asked the other guy <laughs> <laughs> you know i mean you're not even I, i'm rarely being asked about references that i'm pulling from I, i'm spending more time talking about being a woman or being a person of color or, or being both than I am about what I am watching that's influencing the work. And if I want to go in that direction, I would have to force it there. And part of me too is like, why the fuck are you asking me about being a person of color? If y'all motherfuckers listen to me in the first place, the world wouldn't look like this. So why are you asking me this question? You've like, also already answered it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been done answered it. Did you see the thing? I talked about it. Next question. Totally. I think it is also that culturally we like talking about bodies makes us so uncomfortable and we are supposed to only privilege the mind. It's like, there's still this really hard distinction. Yeah. I wouldn't mind privileging the mind too if everybody's <laughs> mind worked right. But even <laughs> then the mind question is still kind of lacking. It's like fudge. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we don't have all the time to unpack that, but thank you all. The one thing I just want to make sure, and uh, Kate, I don't know if this gets reverse edited, but I, I wanted to, one, acknowledge um, the, who I got lower frequency politics from because we're supposed to cite Black women. And uh, my colleague, Farah Rahman is the one who lifted this up for me. So I just wanted to lift her up um, in this moment. And also when you uh, mentioned crunk feminism, Brontes, there's a bunch of people in that collective, but Brittany Cooper is the one that I think of 
um, when I hear the term, so I just wanted to uplift her name. Um, I think we are going to probably wrap up. So I'm gonna try to ask two questions, but there in my research, um, I found this quote from you, Brantes, where you talked about arriving in Oakland in these early days. And so you saying that you took this, you know, you hitchhiked basically, um, makes me think of this quote. And I wanna talk a little bit about this. Um, the, the quote is, you, when you arrived, it was a wild public displays of hedonism back then. If you did that shit these days, these kids would call you out on the internet so fast. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking about working with a lot of young people who are managing like all this anxiety because they're afraid to like fuck up, right? And which is sad because it's in the fuck up that you learn, we all know. Um, but there's something about, you know, social media and cancel culture and, you know, empty virtue signaling and all of that. And so I'm so curious, um, even with Zola, just since that's contemporary, if, you know, Zola probably would have been canceled if those, if that tweet thread had happened today versus six years ago. Um, but I'm just curious for you all, um, where are you with, I mean, cause that was not a question, that was a statement, um, <laughs> but just curious where you all are with, you know, this idea of failing in public. Um, and if that frightens you or if it doesn't, or if you, you know, don't give a shit sort of, if you want to reflect on that. I love that uh, quote, Brontes, yeah. that's such a great quote. Uh, I'm totally terrified to fail in public. Of, of course I am. I, I don't know. I at least haven't, there isn't a, um, a long list of people I can look to who look like me who have been allowed to fail in public and then allowed to keep going. Um, yeah, so I'm a little bit afraid of it. I, I think that I, for the first time in my life, if I, if I am going to fail, I think there, there seem to be other avenues to explore potentially. And I don't know that I had that some years ago, or I don't know that if I had broken into this space five, 10 years ago, that would have been the case, you know? Uh, I think specifically in, in film and TV, um, with women, with people of color, with queer people, there's sort of like a one shot, you know, you're, every, every project is the one that you're being based on. There's not like the work behind it. So yeah, I, I, I love that quote because it makes me think about being young and all of the times that I could have almost died and all of the times that I just made really bad choices, but that I'm so grateful for all of those bad choices. I'm so grateful for all of those drugs. I'm so grateful for every time I got in the back of someone's car that I didn't really know because it's what brought me to being here in this moment with you know the four of us together. My famous quote is, um, I was born canceled. Um, and so just, I think honestly being just like a faggot from down south and also being in all these other kind of um, countercultures, humil humiliation, insult to character and surveillance has always been so woven into the DNA of my existence. It's to the point where, I don't know, I do feel a certain fatigue and I, I do believe in an epic hero's journey. There should be several points where like you are blacklisted or seen as bad. I'm, let me tell you something. Go and read the Josephine Baker biography, read Eartha Kitt's biography, read Nina Simone's biography. There are several points where these women's careers were blackballed, canceled, thrown out because they lived their truth and they paid heavy consequences. Sometimes I feel like I'm not on my right path unless I'm like paying some form of heavy consequence. But I do like, I always go back to my grandmother, you know, and her saying all that Southern shit was like, you really do have to see what the end is gonna be. So in this journey, I do often think this is not a sprint. This is a marathon with each misstep, with each setback. I know that I have to wait and I just have to see, well, in 10 years, what will this look like? What appears wrong today could be very well be prophetic, like tomorrow. It's the only thing that really keeps me going, you know, or maybe, you know, it'll just like fall all to hell. But at the end of the day, I just, I like dramatic 
choices and I like a dramatic story. And I just, I feel like all these things kind of have to happen at once to kind of get at something truth or to get at what is essentially a convincing character and a life that is worthy of reading about and worthy of living. I feel like I fell pretty hard right at like my first sort of public moment. It was a fall. And so, and I don't know, like, I feel like I often feel humiliated, like making art is humiliating in so many ways, or it's just so embarrassing to put yourself out there over and over and to have people, you know, you, you ask them to see your work. It's just this process, it's ongoing, but I think that there are different contexts like within making film i think there's a lot more it's a much longer process and i can imagine that like once people have spent millions of dollars on your work there's sort of these different pressures are applied as far and like the market and that the making art you're sort of always i don't know like it is such a long game and it's um full of stops and starts and and I guess I feel like that process of like always sort of feeling ashamed or humiliated or embarrassed that's sort of built into those like smaller steps but I think what I'm left with is like I would hate to feel like the work wasn't what I wanted it to be or that I hadn't spoken honestly within the story or whatever the thing I'm doing that that's not true to what it should be and that that feels like I'm really afraid of that kind of failure feels like the ultimate sort of, that's the one to watch out for. And, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I wanna ask if you all have any questions for each other and then I have a fun cotton candy question to end on. Mm -hmm. I do. Mine's, it's maybe not that juicy, but I'm just so curious after, I don't know, 16 months of hibernating, what are you most looking forward to on the other side? Wrestling. <laughs> Wrestling with other people. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, you can't wrestle alone, no matter how hard you try. <laughs> Um, I don't miss this at all. I could have easily had another COVID year and just went back to sleep because I realized finally I was resting last year and I was like, how many years have I been running like a chicken with his head cut off? Just being like, oh, Brontes, we have a $200 check for you in LA. Come hop on the mega bus. And I'm, and I'm just like, okay, okay, okay. Um, You're tired. I was very tired. And then, but just like after a year of like kind of resting too, I like, I feel like I, I am prone to make better choices now. And for the first time in my life, I feel like I'm prone to say no, which is something I've never really learned how to do in my life before. What about you, Janixa? Well, I wanna hear Maori's answer. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I didn't know I had to answer. Um, You're part of it. <laughs> I I kind of feel like Brantes in that I could use another year of COVID, but I also um, am very hard-headed and I don't think I learned anything, right? I mean, I did, but I have somehow stayed just as busy um, in this moment and that is really frustrating to me. So, you know, I thought I should have used this time to rest and I haven't. And so I'm very upset with myself. And um, the thing that I'm anxious about is just interacting with humans in person. Um, but I'm looking forward to really being able to travel and feel comfortable doing so. Um, so that, that's the thing, I think, because so much of my work is about gathering. And so I can't imagine uh, you know, another festival where people aren't there or, you know, organizing an exhibition and people aren't there. So I, I just really would like to, I, I'm very much one of those like introverted extroverts, whatever the, the pattern is. And so I very much want to like be in a room full of people only to run away. So I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> 
I wish that I had slept more. I can't believe we're thawing out and I'm still so tired. It, feel, it feels I didn't use the year. I feel I didn't use the year as wisely as I could have regarding rest and recuperation. I spent so much of it very anxious uh, and that really occupied a lot of my time. I am looking forward to being invisible in crowded spaces. I, I really like watching people without them knowing that I'm watching them and I like following people and observing people. And I really miss that. I miss being around a lot of people, but also being able to hide in crowds. Come to New York. The crowds are still here. <laughs> did any, did Brontes or Savannah, did either of you have a question? I was just going to add on to what you said, Janixa, which is like, it wasn't exactly a relaxing time this year. It was hard to rest. It, I feel like our chemicals were, it was not like a easy breezy, let's keep sleeping moment. I, I found in also being still that like most of my writing comes in movement, like on the way to the train or at work or in these moments of repetition, did the rest interfere with your creative process? I do think there's something about, I, I agree with you. Um, like, I feel like, thank goodness I had a bike and I could like, so that your eyes can move around and look at people. And I think that that does really help like open up your mind. And, um, but I feel like maybe I, I, I didn't get enough rest either, but I, well, partly thanks to Kate, because I had this show. And so I was like, really leaned in hard to the stress. <laughs> and, but were you saying, what was the part about rest, Brontes? Oh, just like kind of um, my ideas, I think, come in just like the hustle and bustle of the everyday kind of the walk to the train is when I get the idea of how to connect this plot that isn't happening or being at work and hating it and being in a moment of repetition is when I can make the story make sense sometimes. Whereas like when I'm in this totally sedentary, sedentary space of isolation, the stories don't come to me in the same way or I don't have these thunder cracks of epiphany in the same way. Um, and I was wondering. A hundred percent. I mean, I felt, I think the lack of rest and, uh, and the growing anxiety had so much to do with the rewiring of a system that worked for me mostly. And that so many, I didn't realize that so much of my flow good or bad, or just like how my brain worked had so much to do with being around strangers. And that that kind that I needed that sort of movement. I needed to sweat next to people in an exercise class. I needed to walk by people in a farmer's market. I needed to get pissed off at like the volume someone spoke at. I needed to be like excited by what someone was wearing, that all of that was influencing how I was working how I was writing, because so much of writing is inside your head anyway, so much, or at least for me, so much of writing isn't active, isn't actually like a pen or my hands, it's like in my brain. And that once all of that had been taken away, I didn't know how to activate on my own. And walking my dog wasn't enough because it felt lonely and being outside also felt really scary. There was a big portion of last year that being outside felt scary. And, and then when it wasn't scary anymore, I was wondering, is it not scary anymore? I don't know. Is are we all, is science caught up? Where are we at? Um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, I really, and, and like you, Maori, I also, I, I worked so much because I was so afraid that I was missing this boat. And I was so afraid that we were going to come out on the other side and I wasn't going to have anything to show for it. I don't know why that I, I don't know why I gave a shit about that, but like, I, I just, 
I fold my plate up so much that I didn't even take the time. I like didn't take pleasure in this like breath that I actually needed. And now I'm looking back and going, damn it. Should have gone on a road trip. <laughs> Fuck. I should have learned how to sew on a sewing machine. Like, you know, there are all these things I could have done that I didn't do because I was so worried about all, all this like air. And now I'm just like, well, now that I know if we could just add a plus six months on that, I could really be super active in how I would use that breathing room, right? If you're down, I will glue on a ponytail and we can take the road trip to Florida to find, we ain't even got to dance. We just have to find a place that they'll just give us the $5,000 for showing up. I mean, it's all speculative anyway. Let's, so. Please, I would love that. Come pick me up. Be there, be ready by six. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love that. Um, well, I just wanna, I, I'll close on this um, question that I thought of this morning, which is if you were to make an altar for your artistic practice, assuming you don't have one already, who would your icons or deities, like who comprise your gods? Mm. You know, I got that altar at home. I got my pentagram right here. Like I, like, I get on some weird shit. Um, uh, I love um, problematic white women from the early century. Isadora Duncan, Martha Graham, like all the drunks, right? Um, the Flannery O'Connors, you know, but then I'll throw in like the Pearl Baileys, the Catherine Dunhams. The, I got an Eartha Kitt tattoo on my stomach right here because she's like my favorite. Um, and then, yeah, like just for good measure, um, too, I probably, I probably, like, who's the one? There's this one person I'm forgetting. Oh, Tom of Finland. He's on my altar, too. So a lot of drunks. <laughs> they don't call the spirit for nothing. Damn, that's a good question. Yeah. I, I need some time to think about that. It would it would probably be a photo photographers, a lot of photographers and and then scents, I feel like lavender and rosemary and neroli. I feel it would be a lot of scents that I want to be engulfed in. Roses. I would definitely have Buster Keaton on my altar. And also Martha Graham, gotta have Martha Graham. And yeah, it's, that's a heavy, I, I'll have an answer by the next time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna do homework on who's on my altar. I have a, on my fireplace, I have my mom, my sweetie, and then Brontes and I are on it. <laughs> but that's just the very beginning of a, <laughs> No, I love that. I wouldn't be able to answer that question. So I appreciate y'all even trying. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, you're all such incredible artists. I enjoyed this so much. I'm looking forward to all of the amazingness you're gonna continue to bring into the world.